Welcome to this afternoon's event. Um, I'm Perona Prasad, curator of the Hyong Gallery at Downing College, and it is my pleasure to be the facilitator of this Q&A. Many thanks to Crash and Art at the Allison Richard Building for organising this discussion with the editors of Roar, an artist book about art and sustainability co-edited by Rosanna Greaves and Marina Velez. To talk about Roar and reflect on how art is part of the conversation around sustainability, we're very pleased to have both editors of the book, Rosanna and Marina, here with us today. Rosanna Greaves is an artist, researcher and senior lecturer in fine art at Cambridge School of Art, Anglia Ruskin University. She's a member of the steering committee for the AHRC research group, Debating Nature's Value Network. Rosanna's art practice is multidisciplinary, working with sound, text, sculpture and moving image, often working in a site specific context, exploring place as material. Her broader research interests include temporality, environmentalism, language, deconstruction and documentary methodologies. Her film, The Ra Flaming Rage of the Sea, supported by Arts Council England, has gained international recognition. It received Certificate of Excellence Best Experimental Film at the Dumbo Film Festival in New York 2019 and has been screened at various exhibitions and film festivals across the UK, USA and Canada. Dr. Marina Velez is an artist and researcher working across several areas of contemporary art and sustainability. Marina's practice focuses on people's behaviour and social construction of values, placing emphasis on how these affect the protection or degradation of other species and the environment. She's a member of the Swiss Art Artistic Research Network and Art Research Circle 7 at the Nordic Summer University. She's also the founder and organiser of the Sustainability Art Prize and the Cambridge Sustainability Residency for Artists' Sakes. We begin with an introduction to Roar by Rosanna and Marina. So this is um, a broad introduction to the publication of Roar that uh, Marina and I co-edited. And we wanted to make um, a publication, but thinking about the space of the page in a similar way to how we might curate any other um, exhibition. Um, and we invited eight other participants and ourselves to contribute um, chapters looking at broad notions of the complexity of sustainability and its aesthetic. So that gives a, a sense of the scale of the publication and what it may feel like to hold in your hand. So the first chapter is from artist and researcher Maria Rebecca Balestra with a text from Camilla Boemo um, looking at art and ecology um, and it is mainly comprised of photographs, Rebecca's photographs of desert and barren landscapes including the Arctic ice melt. Um, this is a double page spread and gives you a sense of how we worked with our designer, Clara Block, um, throughout the publication of RAW, thinking about the kind of overlapping and intersecting of images um, and how they sit on the page and how they relate to one another. So this type of collaged aesthetic is something that um, you'll see repeated throughout the publication. The second chapter is from curator Fiona Parry. It takes an essay form. Um, Fiona is curator at Turner Contemporary where she curated an exhibition called Animals and Us. And this chapter is part of the sort of broad research um, around that theme. She discusses the work of four contemporary artists who work with ideas of embodying the non-human animal as part of their practice. Um, and the artists she discusses are Marcus Coates, Pierre Huig, Marguerite Timur, and Diana Thatter. The next chapter is entirely visual um, by Kai Loscott, who is an artist and researcher, and it's called Crop Marks and Vanishing Points. Um, and it very much deals with the context of the book as the form of a grid and its borders and edges, um, the materiality of the book and what is peripheral to the book and the ecological implications of the material production of physical books. The next work is a collaboration from Angelica Boek and Uli Eger. Um, 
It combines two works. Um, firstly, Angelica's self-portraits in different societies as a Western woman in the Borneo jungle, in conversation with um, their collaborative work, One Million, where they created multifunctional porcelain objects for use and survival in the jungle. And it takes the form of a in conversation around these broad thematics at the top of the page, such as global joy. The next uh, chapter takes an essay form from Michael Hibrinayak, where he discusses the beat poet Michael McClure's um, poetry and his interest um, between biology and language. So the performance of the poem and how he attempted to renegotiate species boundaries of communication um, using the voice. The next chapter, again, is entirely visual um, dealing with the context of the book. It's from artist Lisa Wilkins, where she creates these collages of her own hands, um, looking through a number of different books um, and uh, looking at ideas of work, labor, political and sociological connections and gender inequality. And then it's Marina's chapter, Camelopard, um, where she is uh, mainly takes the form of a visual chapter with um, a context introduction, um, where she's using images from various sources, um, such as social media and family albums and encyclopedias to look at human and non-human relationships, interspecies encounters and the exploration of other knowledges. It's then my chapter, which is an in conversation with my brother, who is a lecturer in philosophy at UEA, um, where we discuss my film, The Flaming Rage of the Sea, which was commissioned by the Debating Nature's Value Network, um, which is a research group that we are both um, a part of, um, and thinking about alternate value systems, natural capital um, and ancestral memory. We then have another collaborative piece from Kelsey Davenport, Norast, Sally and Sarah called The Archive in the Contested Landscape, where they've created four intersecting stories, um, particularly around a journey of soil across continents um, from Basra in Iraq to Cambridge and geopolitical issues around water. And then the final chapter is from Stefano Cagol called The End of the Border of the Mind, where um, four writers discuss his work called The End of the Border, where he traveled um, throughout uh, Europe from where he lives in Italy to the Arctic Circle. And whenever they encountered a country border, they would shine this um, very bright beam across this construction, man-made construction of a physical border between countries. So that gives you an, uh, an overview of um, some of the themes and the aesthetic of the publication of RAW. And Marina is just going to um, briefly introduce the um, online exhibition and conversation. Thank you, Rosanna, for introducing the, the book and the chapters and the artists and collaborators uh, that work with us. And uh, now I'm, I'm going to say very few, very quickly, very few words about what is happening uh, now uh, uh, in RAW, so if in, in CRASH. So um, Rosanna and I, um, uh, after working for um, a long period of time, putting together this uh, curated book, um, uh, finally um, uh, had a book launch in Venice in 2019. And um, after, after that, we always uh, knew that we wanted to uh, present the book here in Cambridge which um, in, a, in a very strange way, Raw was conceived in, in Venice in a way and, and executed in Cambridge, presented first in, in Venice and, and then uh, now is, is, is another opportunity that we, uh, a year uh, after the uh, book launch, we revisit. We invited some um, of the contributors 
to uh, discuss, uh, to show uh, work again and to discuss how the work has moved on uh, or, or probably not. So this is an exhibition that you can visit online and you can enjoy the, uh, the films. Of, for instance, the video of uh, Rosanna is available here. Uh, the video Camelo Part and other videos, Stefano's um, uh, video as well. So you can uh, visit the exhibition. And also uh, you can, uh, um, we invited the uh, collaborators to have a conversation and reflect back uh, from the years since the publication. Um, so how the works have evolved, but how, how the conversation about art and sustainability has evolved. So that was, that, that's also available there uh, in the page in uh, Crash, uh, in the Alison Richard uh, building, uh, art at the Alison Richard building. So um, thank you very much. It's over to you, Prarona. Thank you so much. Um, so I've got my own copy of Roar, um, so you can see it in my hands as well. <laughs> um, I just wanted to kick things off by asking what might seem a very um, sort of obvious sort of question. Um, so you're both visual artists um, working in multiple media. Um, what made you think about uh, creating a book on the subject of sustainability in art? What do you think that a book can achieve um, that individual artworks cannot? Or how does a book on a shelf act differently to maybe an artwork in space or online? Yeah, that's, that's really, really interesting. So there are several questions there. So first of all, uh, both Rosanna and I have been working um, in art and sustainability for a number of years. Um, so the interest was already there. And uh, we have also uh, individually uh, curated exhibitions in the typical in, in galleries or, or outside in cities or even the, the countryside in my case. Um, but we, we thought about curating a book um, as as a way of uh, holding, uh, giving space, holding space for, um, for contributors, for artists to respond to the theme of sustainability. And for me, one of the questions was what's different between the book? So the, the book, I have my copy here. So the book is, is in a way, I think in a way it's, it's a kind of, activated time-based media because the reader, so when you engage with the book, I think as you turn the page, one work is, ob is obscured and the next work is revealed. So, and if, when, if you have something like this, like Lisa's work is meta, uh, is a conversation with itself. And um, so, so that is, one of the difference, because in my experience, and, and, and I'm sure um, Rosanna will have, um, uh, will share with us her experience, my experience of curating, uh, where, um, you know, exhibitions about sustainability, and is that um, it's very important that the connections and the links that are made between the works. But if you are in space and you can walk towards, towards the works and the works reveal themselves from a distance and as you get closer, you, uh, the legibility becomes a little mm -hmm. bit more intense and how you engage with them and how long you engage with them is up to you. But you, in general, you can make the connections in the experience of the, of the exhibition as a whole. Whereas in the book, um, you can put the book in the shelf and come back afterwards and, and start from, you know, at a random. So it's, 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 it is different. There, there is a difference there. However, the connections are made in a similar way, both intellectually, aesthetically, psychologically, etc. So the connections are there, but in a different way. What do you think, Rosanna? Is, yeah, absolutely. I mean, I agree in, entirely with that. I, I think there's also something where 
we very much approached the project as artists and as the invitation for the contributors to respond as artists or practitioners in whatever format they work. So I think wanting it to be quite an open conversation and wanting it to be a space where people could perhaps explore ideas and um, think about the interconnections between their interests. So to think of the book as a whole as a collaboration. And I think that was something we were very clear about and keen on right from the beginning. Um, obviously the sort of practicalities of that are dependent on people's, um, I guess their ability to be in the same place at the same time or where or how those conversations um, can take place. But I think there's something about, as Marina was saying, that the kind of one work obscuring the other. So you have this um, space where a singular a single chapter can exist but then throughout the whole thing there's a continuity particularly being in black and white and the way that we worked with Clara our designer there's a sort of continuity throughout the whole book and the book's aesthetic that hopefully doesn't override the individual works but kind of works together so that it becomes a, a kind of singular artwork and exactly that thing that you know I think there's also something quite um everyone who has a copy of the book has the same, you know, it's the same content and it exists in its same form um, and you can engage with it as you want, but there's no kind of hierarchy there um, with the access to the material. Yeah, I mean, that, that really um, comes through when you're handling the book and when you're having a look through it. You just, you know that it's an artist's book. It's not uh, you know, it's 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 not an illustrated text. It works together like an artist book, and um, and I can imagine that you know um, a lot of the the works that are um, kind of re reproduced in the book they exist in different forms. Mm -hmm. um, and so, what was that process like? Sort of extracting the book form from the sort of original artworks or the artist's thoughts? Um, sorry, Marina. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was a process of, um, um, you know, but sustainability is just so vast as a theme. It's, it's you know, it's so, so wide. How, how to approach it. Uh, so for us as an artist and curators of the book, the decision was to invite collaborators that could uh, approach the themes of sustainability from different angles and engage in different conversations of, of this vastness. And of course, you cannot count with every voice and every theme because that would be impossible, uh, but, uh, you know, a variety of approaches. And uh, in that respect, that that is the richness of some of the uh, collaborators engaged with the idea of the book and the page so it kind of also um sort of expanded the conversation of curating the book uh, as a as a as a thing as a singular thing yeah yeah and i think it, it didn't um we didn't set about it in that in the sense of knowing there were artworks that existed and wanting and inviting those people to then um, translate that into a book form. It was a much more kind of fluid and open invitation. So actually we knew the works of the contributors, but the invitation wasn't necessarily for them to contribute a specific work. It was more that they could develop new work if they wanted to or develop work they'd already made for the page and think about that adaptation. So we had a we had an idea about people's interests, but there was also an opportunity there for, for it to be a kind of live and productive space. So actually one of the first things we did um, right back at the beginning of the project was once we had um, put out invitations for the contributors as we held a, a sort of somewhere between a writing retreat and a, and a residency um, where whoever was available could come together in Cambridge for a week and we could discuss those ideas, people could start to develop their works. And one of the reasons we wanted to do that was to also 
create a space where we could start to think about the collaboration and that perhaps people would meet each other and their ideas would, we would think about those intersections, perhaps they would directly collaborate, perhaps there would be some sort of frictions there that we could work with. And I think one thing that that, that did, um, even if there wasn't necessarily a direct crossover to people collaborating together. I think it opened up this way of working and network that then allowed people to, to think about those interconnects, to think about how the work sit together, certainly to think about the space of the page. And also we then found that quite a few of the contributors invited other people in to collaborate with them. Mm -hmm. So it became a kind of expanded and even more open network. That's really interesting to know because you do sense that um, even though the works, um, even though each contribution is is entirely separate and deals with entirely, you know, um, deals with you know themes or approaches unique to that particular contribution, the book works as a whole um, and sort of flows from one to another. So you know, the idea I, I loved in the introduction, Marina's inter introduction, that you know. It's, it's about um, giving voice to um, the voiceless, to species, to the planet, to uh, dispossessed peoples. But at the same time, all of those voices come together in a sort of roar um, mm. that, uh, so, so how did the title come to you? Um, Oh, I, yeah, I can't remember. No, I think it was exactly that. Yeah, we had a few ideas um, of what, you know, because there, because there is quite a broad, broad spectrum of, of topics that we cover. Um, I think we wanted something in a similar way to how you might, you know, title an artwork. Um, we wanted to have something that was quite powerful and urgent. I remember discussing kind of what we wanted, urgent. maybe the title to conjure. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, it was one of one of the options and we both thought that was quite a, I think it was also partly from, um, thinking about these different types of voice, thinking about Michael's contribution um, and thinking about wanting, wanting there to be a sense of activation. Mm -hmm. A sense of amplification almost mm -hmm. of um, yeah. all these. Yeah, and a sense of, as you said, giving voice, giving, you know, uh, recognition and uh, persona to mm -hmm. those who don't have it, yeah. Mm. Yeah, um, I mean, while looking through the book, one of the things that came to my mind was this concept of, you know, the empathy gap, um, which is, uh, it's a cognitive bias in which, you know, people when they're in a um, emotional state, um, you know, um, or, or they, they're, they're sort of agitated by something, they tend not to be able to look beyond that at a wider global picture. Mm. Conversely, people when they're in a very calm and rational state, um, you know, rational, um, they underestimate how the how emotional states affect them and affect their decision making. Um, so to me, it seems like some of the most interesting artists and a lot of the artists in um, the book, they operate within this empathy gap. Um, so how important do you think it is to create empathy with other living creatures and with distant peoples um, in order to advance the cause of sustainability? Yeah, yeah, that's empathy is a key word. Um, the, the interesting thing is that we don't use it as a word, we just approach it aesthetically in a different, mm -hmm. you know, kind of approach it and then retreat and approach, explore it from another angle and then re retreat and try to, um, to build and knit together a complex, really entangled um, book that, that uh, presents something that is complex and without presenting a solution uh, that was never the idea, but not even the solution of the empathy. Mm, 
but rather the experience of, of empathy. And, um, and I remember the conversations that uh, Rosanna and I had when we looked at the, art, uh, the artworks and the works that uh, people had submitted. We, we looked at, oh, well, this talks about landscape, but it's about the connection to the landscape and how the relationship and the empathy was always there, the empathy to the, uh, those who came before. So looking at the past in order to understand the present, uh, looking at other species, looking at the gap, what happens, looking at human exceptionalism, but then within that conversation also class exceptionalism or gender exceptionalism. So complexity of the layers of these conversations. Yeah, yeah. what do you think, Rosanna? Yeah, absolutely. I think those ideas of complexity and, and I think also think um, something about the operation of, of an artwork, like what you desire as a form of engagement, really. Mm -hmm. But, you know, I think there are maybe more direct ways of instigating change around the way that we um, enact in relationship to the natural world. But I think part of that is how do you how do you get people to take something on board or or question something within themselves and I think that art in all its forms plays a really essential role in that because I think if you have the ability to perhaps touch people or perhaps um set people into a state where they are in a different type of questioning um, that and something lingers within them some of the questions linger within them beyond just that moment of looking at mm -hmm. something that you have a, a full engagement that that you then have to kind of live with and start to negotiate and I think that is empathy but it's also something to do with tension um, and I think sort of playing between those those two things is is yeah what good artwork <laughs> does um, and also what how you maybe do enliven a sense of kind of action um, mm -hmm. and reaction to things. Yeah, I mean before um, going any further, I just wanted to remind um, all attendees that you can submit questions through the Q and A. We will be getting to the Q and A later. Um, in this session. Um, but I mean, coming back to that, you know, artists working in that zone um, that you um, sort of described, Rosanna, um, I was really pleased to see the, um, the contribution by Fiona Parry because uh, Animals and Us at Turner Contemporary, um, I saw it quite by chance, the exhibition. Um, and it was the best exhibition I saw that year. Um, it was just one of the most sort of um, catalytic sort of exhibitions, um, most thought provoking exhibitions that I've ever seen. But I, perhaps it was also because it was so novel. What do you, I mean, in, do, do you think that the art world, um, the kind of formal art establishment, um, do you think it's making any progress towards, um, you know, programming more um, exhibitions around the ideas of, you know, around climate change and an aesthetic response to sustainability? Do you think that's happening as artists? I think so, yeah. I mean, I think it's something where, um maybe maybe sort of 15 years ago there was a bit of a resistance to not necessarily political work but work that that is attempting to kind of engage with people in, in a particular way and I think that through I mean th maybe through also the actions of artists and you know I think it's something that maybe is in many more people's sphere of thinking and so it it inevitably links in and I think that is accepted and then particularly when you you know shows like Animals and Us where it is taking on a kind of essayistic um, platform mm -hmm. of 
working with really interesting um, artists, selecting really fantastic artworks and putting forward a, a kind of conversation or an argument um, in a particular form. I, I think, I mean, obviously I'm maybe tuned into it, but I, I certainly think there has, yeah, there has, there is certainly progress there. What do you think, Marina? There is progress uh, and uh, there are so many exhibitions uh, being put, to, so many new conversations from Black Lives Matter to uh, Among the Trees in Whitechapel. There are so many um, exhibitions and events that are circling around the themes that are important at the moment, that are urgent. And, and I agree with Rosanna, 15 years ago, it would have been considered too political uh, mm -hmm. or too one-sided. And now is is rather um, a glass through which you see or you engage with the work rather than a position. It's just almost embedded everywhere, yeah. Yeah, I mean, at least one of the things that I found interesting is that, um, you know, certain exhibitions that are not necessarily fine art exhibitions like the exhibition about the Arctic at the British Museum, it also incorporates mm -hmm. fine artists, you know, to talk about um, the kind of, contemporary relationship with that space. Um, so I, I think I think those are, are, are really welcome steps, um, but it feels like there's this kind of um, momentum towards kind of looking at this as a, as, as a sort of, you know, it sh it, that sustainability um, should inform how we function, um, you know, how we, how we put exhibitions together, um, you know, um, from 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 how the materials that we use to, um, you know, all the buildings that house the artworks, all of those questions. Um, I'm going to kind of um, focus in on your contributions a little bit more because you're both here. Um, I really enjoyed um, the contribution um, on the camelopod, um, the um, the giraffe. Um, and I think Marina will explain that more, but um, you've talked about the limits of human understanding and imagination um, in understanding the plight of animals. Um, can you just expand on that um, a little bit more? Yes, yeah, so, so my contribution to uh, the book is called Camelopard, which is the name given to the giraffe in medieval times before uh, anyone had ever seen a giraffe. So it was a, a sort of drawn, uh, painted, um, based on narrations of people who had been to places to Africa and seen a giraffe and then how that a narrative with a lot of imagination and a lot of kind of gets transformed into um, the depiction of an artist that um, uh, depicts the, the giraffe. And it was uh, considered that it was a combination of uh, a camel and a leopard because mm -hmm. it had spots like a leopard and uh, it looked like a camel too. Well, anyhow, th there, are, there are very uh, different incarnations of, of those um, uh, drawings and they are, they are extraordinary, they are fantastic. And the, the book I engaged in my research is Johnston's, uh, um, Encyclopedia of Animals, um, which is in the um, uh, here in Cambridge. Uh, to my surprise, uh, is uh, is um, in the Earth uh, Library, and um, the librarian um, uh, allowed me to come uh, to photograph the book, to visit the book, to see, and to be in communion with those um, those extraordinary drawings and prints um, of how uh, animals were understood or misunderstood or imagined. And I think I tapped into that to bring in what, what's happening now with extinctions, with exploitation, with abuse of um, intensive farming and so forth. So how, um, how to engage with that conversation of lack of understanding. And also a, a pivotal book by Franz Deval that is called Are We Smarter uh, Enough To? 
understand how smart animals are. Mm. And, and then I, I, I realized that how so many artists are working on that in different ways, like um, Candida Hofer um, or Marcus Coates. And it, it, it kind of, um, I, it's, it's such a big topic that to realize uh, that there are a whole number of other species out there. And, uh, and you know, the, the, all the problems of, of anthropocentrism is, is that looking at, uh, at your own, um, at, your, at, at yourself is just so narcissistic as a, as a species that I thought, well, we need to, we need to expand this conversation. We need to unpack this. Um, and that's a little bit camelopard. And, and the funny thing is that uh, while, while I was doing the research, I realized that um, I had as a child an encyclopedia of animals that were bought uh, to me by my grandfather. And I, a lot of things were connected, revealed then, lots of understanding of my own exploration as a person, not just as an artist and what is important to me. Mm. And I'm not alone there. Many people are working in the same, the same way, uh, talking about personal stuff and Rosanna as well, very, mm -hmm. very personal stuff. And uh, almost all the contributions have links to um, something really deep inside, um, in inside each of us. Yeah. So, so I don't know whether that uh, answers the question. For me, my contribution in particular, Mm, is, is an exploration of that distance, that mean, misunderstanding. And when we can understand, we complete with our imagination and we kind of project onto animals all sorts of things from mystic and, uh, mythical animals mm. uh, to um, we extract from animals, we just all, all the things that we do, uh, that is that a relationship I want to question with my work, yeah. Yeah, no, that's really interesting. And that kind of follows onto a question that I have for um, Rosanna, because um, I mean, we were really pleased that um, The Flaming Rage of the Sea was shown um, in um, the Huon Gallery as part of the Cambridge Film Festival's environmental documentary strain. And, you know, from coming from what you were talking about marina about um actually questioning how much we understand animals and 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 their suffering and all of that to kind of the question of how much value we put on animal life or value we put on um you know other species um i mean in in rosanna in your film you're you're, you're kind of constantly weighing up the ecological impact of draining the fens with the potential gains or um, the value of migration to inhospitable terrains um, with the potential gains of kind of exploiting um, uh, the um, natural environment for economic gain. Um, so how do you see your work interrogating these very sort of entrenched value systems that um, we forget are still operating now as they did two centuries ago. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I was delighted to have my film uh, shown in Kion Gallery as well. Um, I think that this notion of value is something that, um, well, it was kind of the starting point to the film. So I was commissioned to make an artwork um, by the Debating Nature's Value Network. And I think, that itself has value in, mm -hmm. in the title. Um, and I was thinking, before I knew what I wanted to do with that particular commission, thinking as a starting point of what my what I could contribute as an artist um, to the discussion around natural capital. Um, and it seemed that this complexity of value systems or well, making a work that maybe does think about alternate value systems um, and actually what the term value might mean or where it might come from as a starting point. So almost detaching or rethinking um, a notion of value is to not 
to not be in a capitalist or, or monetary sense, but to think about our other ways or types of valuing. And specifically in the, in the FEN landscape um, of thinking, there's a sense of the value in the land because it has been drained and that has allowed for it to be incredibly fertile, arable land. Um, but the value to the people who live there or have lived there um, and who worked on the land, I think this a sense that it's not just our value of the land, but actually how a land or a landscape or a particular place affects us and becomes part of us so that you don't necessarily have a, a sense of exchange like an exchange rate of the value something can be as you were saying be kind of embedded or entrenched and I wanted to kind of express that in in the embodiment of of um uh, the film particularly using the stilt walkers as a apparatus for this kind of embodying of the landscape that it's not just um what the landscape or that particular the physicality of the land does for us as humans who want to farm it but also how it changes us or has changed the people who lived on on the fens um because it was a very and can still be quite an inhospitable um type of landscape um particularly dealing obviously with ideas around um sea level and sea level rise and a, a looming threat of um, the waterline just being held beneath the surface mm -hmm. and that, that can kind of, you know, it's quite important at the beginning of the film that it starts in the mist as this kind of leaking of the water from the land. Um, I think also in terms of value systems, it is a very personal, as Marina was saying as well, it is a very personal place to me. It's somewhere that um, my family had a farm. Um, I spent a lot of my childhood there. And seeing the kind of hardship of working on that land, but also its, its um, beauty and uniqueness um, was very important. And then a sort of ancestral memory that comes through that, that I feel like I maybe have a sort of depth of understanding for. And that was one of the reasons why I wanted to include the voices of um, five, older women who, who have lived there um, to talk about their kind of memories, but also their memories of stories that they had been told mm -hmm. that goes back further than, than the span of their, their lifespan um, of the, the kind of changing of that landscape and what it has meant to see that. And, and I think this idea of kind of tension and change. Me, my grandmother speaks about old Granny Whiffin, who is her great grandmother, um, who was considered to be a, a witch, or at least that was kind of part of the rumor. But thinking about this valuing of other types of knowledge, where at the time, kind of understanding particular herbs that grow in, in a specific landscape and how that can help heal the diseases of that particular landscape. And you know, throughout history, how those types of knowledges have been useful or accepted and then um, deemed to be the threat of somehow rejected, um, particularly sort of through modernity of kind of, I mean, I think that's also something that's changing. I think there's a reignition of interest in, in kind of um, herbal remedies. Um, yes, and I think this, this idea of, um, how we attribute value and value being a sense of um it doesn't yeah a kind of a sense of attachment or meaningfulness mm -hmm. as, a, as a translation of that word yeah no i mean that is um that really comes through the works both because uh, you have a q a with your brother um and you know it's a formal q a but it's with your brother and you get that sense of of a, of a shared um history um in the q a itself um one of the things that uh you know i mean thinking of categories um for a moment in order to talk about uh sustainability um climate change uh changing landscapes, land use, all of those things. 
Um, did you find that you had to grapple with um, the science uh, of climate change, the science, the, the, the data, you know, um, those sources of inspiration that aren't normally associated with creating artworks? Um, you know, how did you approach that? Yeah, in, 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 in my work, um, and during the research, um, and when you look at extinction, species extinction, you, you have a lot of data, you have, you're confronted with a lot of data. And as you manage those data and try to kind of understand the enormity of it, at some point it hits you um, what's happening. And, 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 and it's at that moment that I think Rosanna mentioned several times the tension and it's a sort of psychological tension in which you you ask the important questions you know why why are we doing this mm -hmm. <laughs> and and then and then the, the, that space opens up and it's there where the, where the work becomes interesting and starts flowing mm. and for me um juggling with data um I didn't, I had a lot of data to look at species extinction, but when it's dry, it's, it's like the life has been sucked out of it and, and it's just numbers. Um, and one particular uh, author, Deborah Bert Rose, brought it to, to life to me. So she, she talks, she works in, in Australia with Aboriginal people and uh, people and, um, uh, she looks at uh, the relationship between um, uh, animals uh, and, and mm -hmm. uh, humans, uh, or, or they, they say <laughs> humans and non-human animals. Um, and uh, she explores that as, as a way of relating to ecosystems and finding our work way to work with nature and be part of nature rather than against it. So um, for me, it was a voice that um, allowed me to enter that scientific arena in a, in a more kind of caring way. And when I say, I say her about all the other feminists like Donna Haraway, Rosie Braidotti, that helped me to connect Robin Kimmerer, to connect with what is happening, the enormity that what is happening in a more caring way. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. So I think Rosanna, I'm sure you, with, with your fence, when you research the fence and, uh, and what happened to, um, you know, the water level rising and all of that. There's a lot of numbers and lots of scientific information. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I think, you know, I think it's, it's often part of the, the, the sort of starting point of gathering the data, gathering the research, finding exactly kind of specific points that you decide perhaps deserve further interrogation or that can you find come up again and again or fold mm -hmm. into the artwork in some way. And I think, I mean, I think probably Marina and I both find ourselves in situations where we perhaps present at conferences and we're the only artist um, as the kind of uh, counter voice. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, you're absorbing that information of other people's presentations, but also thinking what, what, what your form of presentation can offer in itself. Yeah. Um, and, and the opposite, you know, is sometimes presenting amongst artists or in exhibition um, and how the subject matter then kind of forms that translation. So I think, you know, there is, there is data, but I think as Marina says, the kind of, you know, tr thinking how you, how you maneuver through that and when it's important to highlight certain things or perhaps when it's important to think about how that can be articulated through a different type of communication or a different type of voice. No, but I'm really glad that you are presenting um, in, um, on platforms where you're the only artist. I think that's really important um, for artists to be represented in those conversations. Um, I mean, I think we are, um, we're not running out of time, but we're slowly creeping um, towards the end of the session. So again, if anybody has any questions, you can pop them in the Q&A. 
Um, now, at this time, you can't really have a conversation with artists um, and not talk about the pandemic. Um, we all know that global pandemics are triggered by habitat encroachment, by the movements of people, by a basic kind of disregards for ecological balance. Um, has living through the COVID-19 pandemic um, informed your current work um, or added to your thinking about the work you've already made? Because um, of course, Roar was, was ready before um, COVID, so. Marina, do you want to start? Um, yeah, um, I am um, one, a big part of my research uh, happens in the rural, particularly in Spain. I work with shepherds and farmers there. Um, because of the pandemic, I, I haven't been able to, to go and do my field work. Um, so, um, so there is a, there is a problem <laughs> of, uh, of accessing uh, the experiential. So, um, and I realized a great part of my work is based on, on, on that, the experience of, so whether it's dialogical experience or um, visual experience, working together and working with the land as well. Mm, so I had to adapt a lot. There is a lot of conversations on social media via telephone and all of that, but uh, we are we are really missing uh, missing seeing uh, each other and um, and this uh, pandemic uh, and also Brexit that happened at the same time it, it brought in some sort of insular kind of provincial kind of looking inwards that um, at the beginning I resented a little bit, but now I'm looking at the rural in, in Britain and around me and uh, because I have no other choice and, and I'm looking at um, uh, creating new work about uh, the gate, gatekeepers. So what is the rural? Who are the gate, gatekeepers of the rural? What the rural means for different people? Uh, so it could, can mean uh, the sublime, the leisure, or um, <laughs> or um, uh, monocultures, or what, what, what does it mean? How different it is the rural here in Britain as it is the, to the rural in Spain with the people I work with. Uh, Yes, yeah, so yes, it has affected my personal work. So it hasn't affected Raw um, because it was, as you said, made before uh, the, the pandemic, but it's interesting. And in the conversation that we had with the people that we had to do it through Zoom, so we couldn't do as we had a sort of writer's retreat to gather together, we just couldn't do it. We yeah. had to do it through Zoom. That that affected obviously the conversation. Yeah. Mm. Mm. I think for me there, um, particularly thinking about, uh, about this work, I mean, in quite a lot of my work, I have worked with people from older generations and sort of, um, collaborating with people in community groups and specifically with this work um some of some of it was initiated by conversations with my grandmother and um so my grandmother did die from covid and i think there's something about losing a generation um or specific voices that you know i think we were talking about kind of value and certainly one of my interests in recording those oral histories was about wanting to give voice to older generations but also to kind of appreciate and kind of understand that knowledge and I think you know obviously there's a personal loss there but I think there's also a global loss that has largely affected older generations so I think there's something there about you know how we're all going to heal from that and what it's going to mean to our societies that I think is important. Um, I think also as Marina was saying there's a there's um, adapting to how we work online that I think it has positives and negatives but I think in terms of sustainability there is some hope there as well that we can perhaps have a more open conversation we can work more globally you know there may be people tuning into this today who would not have you know if we'd been live in Cambridge would not necessarily have been able to to get there that I think 
some of those things I hope will stay and I hope that there's been a sense of um, this time that is a bit of a kind of time out of normality where people can maybe stand back and think about what is important, what is important to them and, and what changes we maybe want to hold on to. So yeah, I think there's, there's loss and hope at the same time. I'm very sorry to hear that, Rosanna. Um, I didn't know, but you're absolutely right in that, you know, people are dealing with this time to evaluate, you know, all the things that we considered uh, absolutely part of the course essential, mm. like, um, you know, all our events held in person with no um, live streaming um, and things like that. And also the fact that, you know, for us in the, in the gallery, even when we were able to open for a short time last year, uh, we saw immediately that, you know, our, our, our most um, loyal constituency, which is older people, were the ones most likely to not be able to have any access in person because mm -hmm. it was just... Um, you know, it was just too unsafe, and and yeah, so so things that we'd never dreamed of before, um, and kind of possibilities of doing things in a different way. Certainly, um, mm -hmm. on that note, we do have a question from an anonymous attendee who asks: Have you noticed ways in which this past year has affected open networking? Are we more open to the possibilities of networking? Um, absolutely, and and um, yes, uh, the, this uh, this idea of that uh, conducting these events online and people can tune in from everywhere um, has, uh, in a way, as Rosanna said, uh, opened up new possibilities. And uh, I like to think of those as um, social proximity. Um, because it's, it's the gathering together of, of people from, from everywhere really. And, uh, and that, uh, that horizontality of participation that online is, is, is great. And networking also uh, becomes a little bit more kind of horizontal, very good. Mm -hmm. Um, we've got another question from Deb who says, I'm an artist with a great interest in your subject and your thoughts um uh but are you concerned generally about preaching to the choir and you want to say thank you for this thoughtful meaningful conversation um i must say i'm not the choir um in some ways because uh the book really opened my eyes to a whole world of different possibilities but i let you respond to that quickly um, it's interesting that that were the preaching because it has a, a very specific narrative voice uh, that um, elevates, drags down, shows the good, the bad, and then redemption. redemption. And that's not what we did uh, in our book. In our book is opening up spaces for dialogue and for people to present their own individual dialogues in their own artworks. And, and so it's a completely different voice, a completely different tone. Mm -hmm. um, and the idea of talking uh, about sustainability to people who are already tuned in into sustainability, that's how the conversation starts. And we all bring different angles to it and that how the conversation expands. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Also thinking something spreading across a kind of multi-format platform. Um, you know, it is an exhibition, there is a conversation, there is a book, um, and you have, you know, the artworks also, as you said right at the beginning, Corona, they, they do exist in other forms as well. So I think there's a kind of extension of that engagement. I mean, I think with any subject, you do have to kind of bring people or people do have to find themselves at a point um, where they're at least at first bearing witness to something and then you form the engagement. But I, mm -hmm. I think, um, as Marina says, you know, it's certainly thinking about the voice as not being one of preaching um, and one of engagement and flow and conversation. 
Yeah, that's a, that's a really good way of putting that sort of uh, the difference between uh, kind of just sending your thoughts out into the world and to you know actually being in conversation mm. um, with others. Um, we've not got any more questions, but we've got uh, two lovely messages. Rebecca Lada says, "Just wanted to say thanks. Really interesting." Um, and um, I'm sorry if I butcher your name. Uh, Kirsimaria E. Toronen says, thank you for answer, answering that and greetings from Eastern Finland. Um, I, that's, that's something I love about um, <laughs> Zoom meetings. Um, greetings to you too. And, um, and we've, we've, we've reached out to Eastern Finland. So that's wonderful. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to thank the both of you. Um, so much uh, for speaking to us today and um, I'm going to treasure my copy of Roar and I um, encourage everybody to have a look at the exhibition online and to um, have a look at the book. Um, I also wanted to invite Judith who's been uh, hiding away um, <laughs> off camera who's actually organized all of this um, for Crash and for our Today RB um, to say a few words to end today's session. Thank you so much, Marina and, and Rosanna. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you for attending this event and thank you, Perona, for chairing this fascinating presentation and q and I would also like to thank uh, Marina and Rosanna for submitting this timely and uh, event and exhibition for the Cambridge Festival. Um, Art at the IRB is an exhibition space at Cambridge University and we run a programme of arts and documentary exhibitions currently online but hopefully soon <laughs> in person again. Um, if you would like to find out more about our exhibition, uh, exhibitions and our current open calls for art, writing and film in connection with Crash's 20th anniversary programme, please visit our website. I'm going to share the link in the chat just now. And thanks again, for everyone, for attending. Well, so that link has come in. Um, I'm going to leave um, the webinar open for a few set moments so that you can um, click on it and, and, and find the details. Um, have a wonderful afternoon, and I hope everyone has a restful Easter break um, planned. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks, everyone.